Good morning and welcome to San Marino Community Church Online. I'm Reverend Jeff O'Grady and on this Father's Day, we especially welcome those of you who are fathers and we celebrate with you on this special day. This weekend is also the beginning of the General Assembly for the Presbyterian Church USA. This happens to be the 224th General Assembly of the Church since the beginning in our American history. It's also the first one that's being held virtually online. We'll keep you informed of developments of the General Assembly, and you'll be uh, particularly aware of those developments when you read the newsletter in July, our community connections. Uh, Children's spiritual formation is at 1015 this morning, so I encourage you to to, uh, watch your watch and make sure that your children are able to join Miss Natalie in the Zoom room for children's spiritual formation at 1015. Also, uh, if you'd like to participate in the chat, you're welcome to do so. You can do it easily on your computer and just join in. Let us know that you're there. Reverend Becca Bateman will be in the chat room this morning responding to your comments and statements. An order of worship is available for you if you'd like. You can download it from the website or from the e-blast that you received. Uh, That way you can anticipate what's happening in worship, and we hope that you'll participate fully throughout the worship service this morning. And finally, I want to thank those of you who helped to donate to the American Red Cross. This week on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, we were fully subscribed. We had 38 donors on each day for a total of 76 donors in all. The American Red Cross thanks you, and I thank you for your support of this important ministry of the church. You know, in a time when things didn't turn out the way they were supposed to, people lamented their situation and their circumstances. Those in power had exiled God's people to a foreign land. All was lost, or so it seemed. And yet, in the middle of that travail, in the middle of the book of Lamentations, the author writes about hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Our opening hymn this morning proclaims that very same hope. So come, let us worship together, and let us sing our opening hymn.
Why do we often fear to follow our heart and our passion in serving Christ? Are we under some misguided impression that were we to fully surrender ourselves to Christ, that we would become people that we don't want to be, sent to places we don't want to go, or made to say things we don't want to say. But nothing could be further from the truth. God calls us to listen to that divine voice that leads us into a life of service and justice. God calls us to live that life in order that we might fully realize the deepest joy of being human. Come, come to confession. Let go of paralyzing fear and misconceptions. Allow God to replace them with the boldness and the fire of a spirit unleashed. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, you have named us and claimed us as your own, making us children of light. Yet we often live in the darkness. We settle for security and comfort where our talents are safely tucked away, our gifts preserved but paralyzed. You call us to live by faith, investing in the world you made, exercising our gifts even at the risk of losing them. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Teach us your ways. Embolden us to serve you that we might make use of the gifts you have given. Set us again on the path that leads to life. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear us now, O God, as we come to you in silent confession, lifting up our personal prayers of confession. Amen. In the year 1350, a very young woman by the name of Julian of Norwich wrote these words. The fullness of joy is to behold God in everything. God is the ground and the substance, the teaching and the teacher, the purpose and the reward for which every soul labors. This is the God who so generously attends to us and heals us. In the name of Jesus Christ, I declare to you, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
This morning, our text of Scripture continues in the sermon series on the book of Romans, and we begin this morning with the third chapter, beginning with the 21st verse. I invite you to listen for God's word for you. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God, through faith, in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance he has passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in a word of prayer? O oh, gracious God, we come once again to hear your word. So quiet within us any voice but your own and speak to us as only a living God can. For we pray in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I want to just begin today with a brief comment about at least one little silver lining I've seen in this stay-at-home order. During this pandemic, many children have learned how to ride their two-wheelers without training wheels. I actually have two grandchildren who have accomplished that particular feat just in the last several weeks, one in North Carolina and one in Nashville, Tennessee. And in both cases, Their fathers were home and available to run down the street long enough to hold on to their seat until they could find their balance and then they were off on their own. The church parking lot these days is filled with young children and their parents riding bikes and skateboards and all sorts of things. And so I believe one memory that our children will have of this entire pandemic is that they learned to ride their bicycle for themselves for the first time. Often, it's fathers who encourage them to take the risk and challenge them to do it on their own. There may be a skinned knee or two, but eventually the child learns that they can do it themselves. Now, as you know, I'm from Minnesota, and we tell stories about two Norwegians, Lena and Oli. Lena was going away for the weekend with her girlfriends and was going to leave the baby home with Oli. So she said, now, Oli, you be sure to take good care of the baby for me. Oli agreed, and off Lena went. On Sunday night, she came back home for the, from her weekend away, and the very first thing she noticed as she walked in the door was this horrible, just terrible smell. 
She quickly ran to the baby's room and she found the baby in the crib. And she looked and she said, Oli, you didn't change the baby all weekend long. And Oli replied, yeah, well, I was going to change him, but then I looked at the diaper box and it said good to 40 pounds. That's dad's for you. Last week, we explored the second chapter of Romans in what Karl Barth calls the night. Our text today is the beginning of what he calls the day. Martin Luther called Romans the purest gospel. And Paul Actemeyer, one commentary, calls this particular passage of Romans the purest Romans. This is a distillation of what the author wants his readers to know. And it begins with this transition. But now, night turns to day. Paul has argued that sin is its own punishment. God withdraws and removes constraint. When grace is resisted, all it does is remove us from the benevolent lordship of God and place us under tyrannical lordship of something completely unworthy of submission to it. An example of this, just think of somebody in Alcoholics Anonymous. The alcoholic thinks that he's drinking the bottle until finally discovering one day that the bottle has been drinking him all along. We belong to the power we choose to obey, the scriptures say. God becomes permissive, withdrawing gracious power and allowing us a free hand to do whatever our desires incline us to do. We become trapped in our own sin. Sin is its own punishment. We're all guilty, all victims of sin, all perpetrators of sin. But now, the conversation shifts. The old conversation with that simplistic calculation of whether you obey the law or not, whether you keep the Ten Commandments or not, a calculation of rewards and punishments, whether you're better than the Gentiles or not, has shifted because God has acted in Christ Jesus. What's at stake? Only the future of humanity itself. However faithless humanity proves to be, God proves to be faithful. First of all, God has this a surprising answer to our predicament. It's not a theory, it's not a formula, it's not a statement. God has broken the impasse through his own son, presenting Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement once and for all. All of humanity is in a crisis, but now there's a way out. There's a righteousness that can return through faith. The second surprise is that the crisis of humanity is not solved through our defeat or through the the defeat of our oppressors. Instead, Jesus defeated the weapons of the crisis itself, sin and death and the evil one. And finally, the third surprise is that this is for everyone who asks for it. It is universal. Gone are the boundaries and the distinctions between us and among us. Now there's no Jew or Greek, no male or female, no slave or free. All are one in Christ Jesus. Amazing grace. Reverend Dr. Earl Palmer entitled his commentary on the book of Romans, Salvation by Surprise. Let me illustrate this with a little story. I actually went online and 
went to Snoop's to see if this story is accurate or not. And they've done a great deal of research and they have said that they don't know whether it's accurate or not. They haven't been able to prove it or disprove it. They do know that this story was around at the time of the Great Depression and nobody at that time refuted the story. But it so illustrates the point I want to make this morning. The story is about Fiorello LaGuardia, the mayor of New York City during the 1930s. He was a much-loved public official with a flair for the dramatic. He was short in stature, but he was the kind of person who just took all the air out of the room when he entered. He loved to wear fresh flowers in his lapel. People referred to him as the little flower, which is actually the transla translation of his first name, Fiorella. Occasionally, LaGuardia, for whom the airport in New York is named, by the way, would hop on a fire truck to ride to New York's disasters with the New York's finest firemen. He would take field trips with orphans. He would join the police on a raid. And he was well known for reading the funny papers over the radio to New Yorkers during the dark days of the Great Depression. On one occasion, on a bitterly cold night in January 1935, LaGuardia showed up in night court in the poorest ward of the city. After dismissing the judge for the evening, LaGuardia took over the bench himself, and within minutes, a tattered old woman was brought before him, charged with stealing a loaf of bread. She told the mayor that her daughter's husband had left, and her daughter was sick, and her two grandchildren were starving. The store owner was also present in the courtroom, and he refused to drop the charges. It's a real bad neighborhood, Your Honor, he said. She's got to be punished to teach people around here a lesson. LaGuardia sighed. He turned to the woman and he said, I've got to punish you. The law makes no exceptions. Ten dollars or ten days in jail. But even as he pronounced the sentence, the mayor was already reaching into his pocket. He extracted a bill. He tossed it into his famous hat saying, here is the ten dollar fine which I now remit and furthermore, I'm going to fine everyone in this classroom or this courtroom 50 cents for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so that her grandchildren can eat. Mr. Bailiff, collect the fines and give them to the defendant, he said. The following day, New York City newspapers reported that $47.50 was turned over to a bewildered woman who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her starving grandchildren. And 50 cents of that amount was contributed by the grocery store owner himself. While 70 petty criminals, people with traffic violations, New York City policemen, each of whom had just contributed 50 cents for the privilege of doing so, gave the mayor a standing ovation. You see, the right response can redirect the entire conversation and get things back on track. Paul is arguing in Romans that the judge has acted in Jesus Christ to rectify our situation. And it's not just that God treats us as if we're something we're not. That only leads to kind of an imposter syndrome. God has imparted himself to those who have faith. Christ in you, the secret of Christian faith. You see, unless we understand ourselves as sinners who, apart from God's grace, are unable to cope with ourselves and our world, and we condemn ourselves to go right on making the same mess of our lives and of our world as those who've went on before us. 
Where is the crisis? Is it in our institutions? Is it systemic or is it personal? Well, it's both, according to Paul. Apart from God's intervention, we will keep making the same mistakes as before. But now there's a new beginning. A different future than the past is possible. It begins by receiving the gift of grace that is in Christ Jesus. God's grace is a gift, but it's also an obligation. God is transforming those who believe And they are participating in the transformation of the world. According to Paul Ochtemeyer, faith calls us to responsibility, not privilege, to a task rather than a status. Let me try and apply this to our current situation and illustrate what I think Paul is trying to say in our current crisis regarding racism. Several weeks ago, a woman walking her dog in Central Park in New York City encountered a black man in the same park bird watching. He simply asked that she put her dog on a leash as required by law and as indicated by a sign nearby, and things escalated. He turned on the video of his phone to capture the exchange. I'm sure you've heard of it. Amy Cooper A 40-year-old woman who lived on the Upper West Side became enraged and she called the police to report that she was being threatened by a black man. Christian Cooper, the black man and no relation, was not threatening her, only asking her to obey the law. It was an ugly portrayal of how privileged people sometimes react when they feel pushed or challenged. And it led, in the words of the New York Times, to anguished conversations about racism and hypocrisy in one of the nation's most progressive cities, end quote. How ironic that they both share the same last name. But see, here's where the Apostle Paul's insights come to bear. Paul would say, you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others for in passing judgments on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. Okay, maybe not exactly the same things, but I think you get the point. Take the log out of your own eye before you seek to remove the speck that is in another's eye. I suspect we don't have to scratch the surface very deeply to find that things we have thought and even things we have said in private in these last weeks we hope never become public. Our worst moments, thankfully, are not captured on a video and shared on the Internet. But we know what we're capable of when we get pushed to the brink and it's between us or them. Backed up against the wall, we know our inclination for self-preservation is so strong that we even lash out against those we claim to love, much less someone we hope we never see again. The problem is within us as well as outside of us. A few weeks ago, during a Zoom staff meeting here at the church, I asked Eva Farrar, our African-American office assistant, to reflect for just a moment on the racial tensions in the country and how her community is dealing with all of it. And she thought for a moment and then responded, This is not a black-white issue as much as it is a good and evil issue. In other words, this is a much more insidious problem than racism, though it includes racism. This is a manifestation of a much larger crisis in humanity. 
Paul might agree with that. This is not just an existential crisis. What's at stake is the future of humankind in these texts. We need a future that's different from the past, but we can't bring it about ourselves. We need a new kind of humanity. You see, how the problem gets defined will determine how the solution gets proposed. There are those today who want to dismantle police departments because the problem is systemic racism embedded within our systems and our institutions. There are cries to defund the police and hire social workers instead. The real problem here is not with individuals but within empires. At least that's the claim. The golden rule of faith has been supplanted with another golden rule that those with the gold rule. They keep the rest of us subjugated. The solution then is to wrestle power from those who have it. Well, at the very least, that's a convenient answer to the problem. But isn't it a little naive to think that you can simply do away with the police and achieve utopia through just self-regulation. That way I'm not implicated or responsible for racism because it's the police who are. Only the privileged and those in power are then held accountable. Sin is institutionalized, it's corporate, it's systemic, not personal. And we can protest against institutional racism without having to address it in our own lives and in our own homes. Removing restraint will not lead to more virtuous behavior automatically. Remember for the Apostle Paul, God's judgment is removing restraint And sin becomes its own punishment. Paul wants to say it is both personal and corporate. It is both individual and institutionalized. We are both its victims and its perpetrators. And unless we understand ourselves as sinners who apart from God's grace are unable to cope with ourselves and our world, then we condemn ourselves to go right on making the same mess of our lives and our world as our ancestors did. It's this fundamental understanding of the pervasive nature of the crisis of humanity that has led the church in different times and different places to take positions expressed in our book of confessions. I want to quote from the book of confessions today, from the confession of 1967. Just like the General Assembly that is meeting currently, in 1967 that General Assembly voted by a supermajority to receive the confession of 67 into the book of confessions. And here's what it has to say in a little section entitled Reconciliation in Society. In each time and place, there are particular problems and crises through which God calls the church to act. The church, guided by the Spirit, humbled by its own complicity, and instructed by all attainable knowledge, seeks to discern the will of God and learn how to obey in these concrete situations. And the following are particularly urgent at the present time. God has created the people of the earth to be one universal family. In his reconciling love, he overcomes the barriers between brothers and sisters and breaks down every form of discrimination based on racial or ethnic difference, real or imagined. The church is called to bring all people to receive and uphold one another as persons in all relationships of life, in employment, housing, 
education, leisure, marriage, family, church, and the exercise of political rights. Therefore, the church labors for the abolition of all racial discrimination and ministers to those injured by it. Congregations, individuals, or groups of Christians who exclude or dominate or patronize their fellow men, brothers and sisters, however subtly, resist the Spirit of God and bring contempt on the faith which they profess, end quote. I believe that's close to what Paul is declaring in Romans chapter 3. The righteousness of God has been disclosed. The righteousness of God through faith in Christ for all those who believe. For there's no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is help, real help in the hour of need. This is a solution that's equal to the crisis we're in. This is reconciliation that leads to a completely different future. The surprise of faith. In Jesus Christ, it changes the conversation entirely. It restores order to a world that's gone astray. And night begins to give way to day. As the psalmist says, there is weeping in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Thanks be to God. Amen. I may speak in tongues of men and of angels, but if I am without love, I am a sounding gong or a clanging sea. the gift of prophecy and know every hidden truth. I may have faith strong enough to move mountains, but if I have no love, I am nothing. I may dole out all I possess or even give my body to be burned. But if I have no love, I am none the better.
last forever. Let's calm our hearts and still our minds and go to God in prayer. Loving God, before even awareness emerged, you have loved us with a fierce commitment. And you have compelled us to stand as a shelter for our children against the winds and storms of life. God, you have taught us that fathering and mothering are not defined by biology but by attitudes and actions that reflect you and your great love and compassion as our creator. So today, O oh God, as we turn our minds towards fathers, we pray that you would bless those who hold our hands and let us dance on their shoes. Bless those, O oh Lord, who must look to you as a model for father because there is no one else. Bless those who choose to be father to teams of children, troops of scouts, orphans, and little ones striving to survive. Bless those, O oh Lord, who teach us to laugh out loud and who break our hearts when we disappoint. Bless those who were never fathers, but whose legacy instead is marked by a small white cross on a beach called Normandy a Saigon jungle, or a storm in the desert. Bless those, O Lord, who plant seeds deep in the earth and dream of a legacy to pass on. Bless those who teach us honor and who respect your commandments. They're the ones who remind us that fathering is a sacred trust. Bless those, O Lord, who celebrate their children and equip them to reach for the stars. And dear Lord, hear our final prayer. We pray for all the children of the world, for every child in every corner of the earth and for every child not yet born. We pray that every person might be given a father's heart. This heart is big enough to reach out to children and the childlike, to those who cannot help themselves until hope is restored and our loving becomes more like yours. We pray these things in the name of your only Son, Jesus, who taught us when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to thank all of you who've been supporting the church during this time. You know, as it says in the scripture, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he became poor so that by his poverty, we might become rich. So I'm especially grateful to those of you who continue to support the San Marino Community Church with your gifts, your offerings, your time, your talent. There are several ways that you can give to the church. You can send your donations to the church office or drop them by. We're open from 10 to 2, Tuesday through Friday. Uh, you can use Venmo or you can go on the website and click on the Give icon and you can 
contribute through your credit cards that way. Whichever way you choose, we're really grateful for your support during this time. Friends, now receive the benediction. To him who by his power within us is able to do infinitely more than we ever dare ask or even imagine. To Jesus Christ our Lord be glory and honor, dominion and power, now and forevermore. Amen.